don't we just bow our heads, close our eyes. If you want to, just maybe lift your hands to heaven. Take that posture of receiving. I love that we had communion today. I love that we can be reminded of the powerful, life-transforming blood of Jesus. You know what I love about His presence is that it's been paid for. I know it's free. You come freely, but it was paid for. It came at a cost. The blood of Jesus paid for so much. And I think sometimes it'd be so easy for us to just gather as a crowd and tick off the fact that we came to church this Sunday. But sometimes it's good for us just to acknowledge what He's done for us. We love you, Jesus. We love your presence. We love you. We're so thankful for you. We don't ever want to feel so entitled to what we've been saved to, but then yet forget what we've been saved from. Where would we be without you, Jesus? And we're so glad that your blood doesn't demand perfection or the sacrifice of the blood of bulls and goats or religious practice and ritual or outward behavior, but Your blood, your sacrifice, the cross does demand a responsive heart. Come on, why don't you just begin to call out that beautiful name, Jesus, right where you are. We've got time today just to take a moment. So we worship you, Jesus. Oh, we honor you, Jesus. We lift you up, we lift you up, Lord. Oh. What can wash away my sin? You sing, nothing. Nothing. What can make me whole again? And what can make me whole? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? What can make me whole? Nothing. Would you lift your hands with me? As we just declare it. Oh, precious is. And oh, precious is come on from the front to the back, side to side. That makes me white as snow. Oh, no other found I know nothing but oh, precious is the flow you see. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me, that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other found, nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but your blood, Jesus. The curse of sin is broken. Well, all our brokenness is made whole. We thank you that we are all level at the foot of the cross. Every skin color, every culture, every tribe, every tongue. From the vilest of sinners to the most practiced of saints. Your blood washes over all of us. Today we ask Holy Spirit, fill this place. Fill this place, fill us. May we decrease so you could increase. Draw us deeper today. In your wonderful, precious name. And everyone here at Nations Church in this service says, can we just honor Him? Come on. This is not hype, it's just a just a heartfelt response to His wonder.
His beauty. So good. So good. How many of you love His presence? I love His presence. I love that His presence is so accepting. And this is what I think is so beautiful about being a Christian is that He loves He loves us so much that He will accept us just as we are. Come as you are. But He loves you too much to leave you as you are. There's more in Him. If you're new to Nations Church, you probably would have might not have heard the word wholeness before, but we're, that's one of our values, what we love here, that we're about wholeness, that we believe that the best you is a whole you. Every single person that is born again in God, that puts their trust in Jesus, we believe that has great purpose, great destiny. Every person significant, highly valued. Amen. You believe that? Four of you. Come on, do you believe that? But sometimes we carry things in life that maybe stop us from being the best versions of ourselves. And the Bible speaks about wholeness. The Greek word is sozo. To remind us that Jesus didn't just die and rise again for us to save us from eternal separation or to give us eternal life. But He died and rose again, do you know? To give us abundant life here and now, here on the earth. It's not that He died and rose again and invites you to believe in Him just because you're freaked out about the thought of hell and then just try and survive here on earth, barely getting by. But I believe that He's called you to be the head, not the tail, to be more than a conqueror, to be victorious. Come on, they're all our definitions today. And so today I just want to speak to you about God's great desire for you, which is to be whole. You know, I believe that the things that limit us most of the time in life are not the things that people can see on the outside, but sometimes our greatest limitations are actually on the inside. Areas in our hearts and lives where we've maybe felt like we ought to be soaring in, but our wings are clipped. And when we read Scripture, it's important to know that the Scripture wants us to read it through a tripartite lens. What I mean by that, it means that you are a three-part being. You are body, your soul, and your spirit. Do you understand that? You're so much more than just your face and your good-looking figure. You're so much more than just what people can see on the outside. But your body, your soul, your spirit. understand that. And so when we read Scripture, we need to read Scripture through those lenses. And that's why when we see in Scripture, in the Gospels and and in the book of Acts of God healing people with physical ailments or physical limitations, it wasn't just that God was dealing with a physical problem. He was dealing holistically in a sozo way to bring transformation to the person, not just at a body level, but also at a soul and a spirit level. And when Jesus came, He comes to deal with us holistically. Acts chapter 3, we see this man who was crippled at the gate beautiful and Peter and John, as they pass by him, hear him cry out and they said to him, well, silver and gold, we don't have because we're poor church pastors. But what we have is the name of Jesus. And then when they said, rise up and walk, he didn't just walk. You got to understand if it all was about dealing with the physical problem of being crippled, then walking would have been fantastic. But the Bible says that he then began walking, body, leaping, wholeness, soul, praising God, spirit. God wants the best version of you, body, soul, and spirit. Someone needs to say a resounding amen. And if the enemy can't steal your salvation from you, He will keep you limited, littered, contained, under continued dysfunction, brokenness, anxiety, grief, depression, fill in the blanks. Today, I want to make a statement. It's like my spoiler, the end of the sermon, right up the front. Jesus wants you whole. Turn to someone and say, Jesus wants you whole. And for some of us, it's hard to even hear that, that Jesus actually wants us whole. We've been walking so much of the journey of life unwhole that we've learned to navigate, manage, accommodate, integrate that as being part of who we are. But you need to understand that Jesus wants you whole. 
And if Jesus wants you whole, then how, how, how do we get whole? How do we access this wholeness that is available through the death and resurrection of Jesus? What posture do we need to bring? Because some of you know that Jesus will do his part, but we also need to do our part. And God has been speaking to us about posture lately, and last few of my sermons have been about posture, and today I want to speak to you on that today. So we're going to go to the book of Mark chapter 10. Who's ready for the Word of God? Mark chapter 10, I'm going to read from verse 46. I could have picked a whole bunch of, uh, of different texts, but I love this, and we're going to use this today. Verse 46, now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. So the Bible gives us great insight into who this person is. We're developing this character here in Scripture, the writer of Mark is doing. Verse 47, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. Verse 50. And throwing aside his garment or his coat, his cloak, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? Very important question. The blind man said to him, Rabbi, or my rabbi, that I may receive my sight. Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise for that text? Thank you so much, Ian. Give Ian a big hand too. Great man of God. Today I want to speak to you on the posture of wholeness is vulnerability. Posture of wholeness is vulnerability. I'm sorry I keep saying this, but, but I just really sense that across the last couple of sermons and this one as well, it's going to do one of two things to you. It'll, it'll either draw you into you know, a place of deep wholeness and intimacy with God, or it'll make you really mad at me. Okay, so if it makes you really mad at me, you can write your complaint email to the following email address. I, we have changed it from last time. The email address is yankalovesmitchxoxo at gmail.com. Happy to take all your complaint emails on that email address. Our understanding of vulnerability, basic, simple understanding is simply this, the willingness to be open about our weaknesses and struggles. The willingness to be open. How many of you were here for Chrissy's message last week? Open up. Just really feel God speaking. We didn't, we didn't, you know, collude or anything like that. We just felt separately. God was speaking to us about this. That vulnerability is essentially a person's willingness to be open about their weaknesses and struggles. And when you think about that posture of vulnerability, it makes sense because Scripture tells us that Jesus won't heal what you conceal. If we keep hiding, God has always been about revealing. Hence the original hiding. Adam, where are you? I was afraid, so I hid. Hiding, makes sense to you. Jesus won't heal what you conceal. There is never healing wherever there is concealing. And so when we go back to this text, we begin to see the, the interactions of Jesus with blind Bartimaeus. Again, read this scripture this text through being a tripartite being, body, soul, spirit. And what you see happening here is at multiple levels. If you are just purely at a factual, external, shallow level, you would see that it's basically just a blind beggar wanting to see. But there was so much going on here. You've got to understand that the writer, Mark, goes on to describe the conditions with which he's living in. When you think about first century Palestine, living in the society that he's lived in, remember, He's blind. Vision impairment in those days was before the time of NDIS. It was before HBF, private health insurance, Medicare, Centrelink. There was no Lions Eye Institute for the vision impaired. Do you understand that? And there were many social economical constraints. There were mar- he was marginalized just for being blind. Do you understand that? So you can, you can imagine society saying, we're not going to help you. We're not going to support you. You're going to fend for yourself. You're unemployable. So you can imagine more than just being blind, there was a lot of other things that are attached to that that would have been part of his blindness. Do you want to follow me so far? He would have, we're talking about like a deep-seated lifetime of rejection. We're talking about society labeling him unclean. We're talking about a lifetime of loneliness. He would have had very few friends because no one wants to be friends with an unclean person. We would have talked, you'd have been talking about a low self-esteem. Maybe, you know, we, we take for granted that our kids can have aspirations and hopes and dreams. We ask young people, what do you want to be when you grow up? He did not have that. 
You know, our kids will say, oh, I want to be, you know, I want to be a fire, fireman. I want to be, you know, a, a doctor. I want to be an engineer. I want to change the world. Fantastic. We encourage that. But to him, you're blind. Shh, shut up, Bartimaeus. Your blindness means your voice is not valid. Your blindness means shame. Your blindness means the myriad of emotional and psychological scarring. Your blindness means you're not significant. All of those things. And then Jesus waltzes down the street. Clearly blind man right there, Bartimaeus. We all know who you are. That's a street corner you beg at. And then Jesus asks him a strange question in front of everyone what do you want me to do for you? Have you ever thought that? Like, if you ever wonder why Jesus asks obvious questions, he's not looking for information. He's looking for a response. Yeah. Yeah. What do you want me to do for you? And as, you know, you know, if you actually read it just at face value, if you're blind Bartimaeus, you could forgive Bartimaeus for being offended at Jesus' question. Like, I'm blind, and you're asking me what do you want me to do for you? Jesus would have been poking at a sensitivity here, right? How many have ever said something to someone and it's completely, in your mind, completely innocent, but they have a sensitivity, and like they take offense at it? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Some years ago, many years ago, I said this once, never again, completely factual observation. I said to Chrissy, has the dryer shrunk your jeans? <laughs> never again. I got saved that day. I met, I met Jesus for the first time. What do you want me to do for you? You are a blind man. All of the crowd would have probably felt the awkwardness of that question. But we're gonna use Bartimaeus' response today as learnings. Is that okay? Who's ready for me to do some preaching? Yeah? So there are some convictions when it comes to the posture of wholeness, being vulnerability, some conviction, some things that you hold in your heart as a conviction that you stand on, because if you don't have these convictions, vulner vulnerability will never be your posture. And the first conviction is this, I'm going to stop hiding my weaknesses and my struggles. It's the conviction of vulnerabilities that I'm going to stop hiding my weaknesses and my struggles. See, Jesus was asking a question of Bartimaeus wanting a response that was hopefully a posture that showed a conviction that I'm gonna stop hiding my weaknesses and struggles. Notice how Jesus stops whole crowd, blind, beggar, shame, rejection. It's all played out there. Jesus didn't say, ooh, 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 ooh. Come, come with me to a quiet corner in the auditorium. I wanna ask you, Ada, can I pray for you? For healing? No, in front of everyone. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? I wanna hear a response, Bartimaeus. Now, Bartimaeus could have felt suddenly really self-conscious and thought, um, okay, can we have a moment? Like, can we, can we like go to your office, Jesus? Or he could have just tried to maybe, you know, or, um, well, can you give me some money? 15 bucks for a packet of cigarettes? I don't even know how much a packet of cigarettes is. Maybe more. I don't know. <laughs> but he says, I, 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 I want to see. I am blind, Jesus, and I want to see. There is something about an interaction that we have with Jesus that simply says, I'm done trying to hide my struggles and my weaknesses. Jesus, it is my conviction that vulnerability demands that I reveal or show or display or come clean or be real about the very areas that I need you to come and heal me in. See, we live in an age where we become masters at hiding our weaknesses and masters at amplifying our strengths. Not a single one of us, if you're on social media, would ever take a photo of your morning face and post it. Hello, come on. None of us goes to Meyer or whatever clothes shop and picks clothes that when we wear it, amplify the parts of our body we don't wear, aren't very flattering. We buy clothes that make us look flattering. Yeah. Hello. That's why so many of us don't come to church when things aren't going so good, in case people actually ask us, how are you going? Yeah. Getting real quiet now, I'm gonna talk to this side, because it's a rowdy bunch. Come on, come on, do you understand? We're so conditioned by society to hide. But I wanna suggest to you today, we have choices in our walk with Jesus. 
Stop hiding our weaknesses and struggles or stay blind and begging. But I want to be part of a church that understands we're together creating a, a, a culture of wholeness. And that means that, that, that we invite vulnerability and it's a safe place before God and before people because, oh man, where are the men and women that are prepared to say, Jesus, this is, this is, I'm not going so great in this area of my life right now. Would you come and heal me? Jesus, I'm struggling. I don't, I, I, I go home and I open that bottle of wine and before I know it, the whole bottle's gone. Jesus, I don't want to medicate my pain like this anymore. Can you come and heal me? Where are the men and women that say, I don't want to be addicted to that pornography or addicted to that, that to, 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 to working so much or addicted to affirmation. I don't want to deal with that grief and carry that offense anymore. Where are the church people that are willing to say, I don't want to hide anymore? Because you can only heal what I'm prepared to reveal. See, if you, if you don't, if you don't stop hiding the areas of your struggle and your weakness, what you end up happening is that you have to manage what you conceal. At best, what you do is manage what you conceal. The lie of the devil tells you this. Oh, just give it a bit of time. It'll sort itself out. Just give it a bit of time and you'll get over it. Just, 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 just give it a bit, just give it a bit of space. There is a difference between moving on and being healed. Toxic relationship, move on. You're not healed, you'll just take that toxicity to another relationship. Move on. How about you just say, Jesus, I've just come through that traumatic time. Would you heal me? Getting real quiet now, come on. See, the desire of his heart is to sozo you, to make you whole. He didn't just die and rise again so that you can just get by in life and then either he comes back first or you die first and then that'll be it. He came not just to give you eternal life, he came to give you an abundant life. Come on, somebody. And this has been a journey for me. There was a season in my life as a younger person where I lived a very unintegrous life. I was actually a chronic liar in seasons as a young adult. I was a single young adult man. I was grown as a man, but I still was, I was like a child on the inside. I was a chronic liar, I lied about all sorts of things, my whereabouts. I was very unintegrous in the way that I dealt with girls. But I was one thing at church, completely different. Outside of the church, I was deeply insecure about my identity and I would ran from the call of God. I was so scared of failure that I just didn't want to serve God. I, I was petrified that I'd be no good in the kingdom. And I remember it so well the day when it all came to a head, some close friends of mine and some leaders called me, confronted me and called me out on my behavior, confronted me on the lies. And I remember being on my knees before God. I remember God, the Holy Spirit saying this, this actual, I felt like Jesus was asking me the question, what is it that you want, Ken, out of this walk with me? What is it that you want? And I, in a ball of tears, said, God, I, I, I want to be free from, from the lies, the spirit of lying and insecurity and putting on an image and pretending to be something I'm not. I remember my pastor at the time, Pastor David, held me in close. And I remember one of our catch-ups, he, he said to me, he asked me this question, who do you want to be, Ken? What's the man of the future that you want to be? And I remember just bawling in front of him and saying, all right. Pastor David, I, I, I want to be a good man. I want to be a man of God. I, I want to be real in my walk with him. And, and then he just looks at me deadpan and says, well, this is the way he talks. Well, I just think you need to learn to be vulnerable. And I had no idea what that word meant. Because Asian and vulnerable do not go together. Asians do their maths homework and play the piano. We, not, we don't do vulnerable. <laughs> I had no grit for it. He began to father me. And I began to learn new language of vulnerability. I began to learn and, and practice a posture. I, I, I began to be really open about my struggles and my sin issues. And in, in that season, I just felt darkness break over me. And, and God healed me. He made me whole. I fell in love with Jesus like never before. And it, be, it began a chain of, of, of a lifetime of valuing what it's like to live this. So, and throughout my life, I, I've, I've learned that the best me is actually a whole me. And, I, and I, you know, for so many of us, 
We feel like if we just keep hiding the thing, it'll just get better. It doesn't. In fact, as we get older, we lose the filter that helps us to hide the very thing. You're getting quiet now. So what do you want to do? Carry bitterness for 40, 50 years? You want to carry unforgiveness for 28 years? Addictions for 13 years? Fear and anxiety for 50 years? Offense for a lifetime? And get to a point where maybe we're so old that the thought of learning a new posture of vulnerability after years of, not, of hiding, concealing becomes a step too far? What happens then? As the years roll on and we get older, we acquire lines on our face, but the scars and wounds still run deep. What happens? All those years later, we're so much older, we haven't learned the posture of vulnerability. Your wife loves you, but she's got to put up with you. You get to an age where your children and your grandchildren honor you because they're honorable people, but they just know they can't bring some things up because it'll set you off. Come on now, complain emails. Yanka loves me at xoxo.com, <laughs> gmail.com. But I'm trying to disciple us into a life of wholeness. See, if, if we don't reveal and we keep concealing, there will be no healing. My prayer for you today in this next season to understand the power and the beauty of what's on the other side of your vulnerability. Come on, are you out there? Imagine the marriage you're gonna have on the other side of your vulnerability. Imagine the older you, the you bless, the you of tomorrow, the you of next year. You don't wanna get to next August, come wholeness season again, carrying the same stuff, still wishing that it would just go away. The second conviction of vulnerability. You guys can sum out of this? Some of you go, no, please stop. Is this, I need to part ways with the familiarity of my dysfunction. I actually need to, it's a conviction, I actually need to part ways with it because sometimes we can walk so long with this thing that we don't almost, we almost don't know how to be if it wasn't there anymore. Hmm. We've accommodated it so much that it's become a part of who we are. We've got a love-hate relationship with it and we wear our dysfunction sometimes like it's a familiar old coat. Hmm. Mark chapter 10, this text. Notice how the Bible goes to great lengths that the gospel writer tells us that Bartimaeus wore a coat which he threw off. Hmm. Scholars believe that in first century Palestine, the Roman Empire didn't want to socially support people with disabilities, crippled, maimed, etc. So in order to kind of make up for it, what they did was give them beggars' licenses, which were government-issued coats. What happened was that everyone who was deemed in, unable to work, had to beg, were given government-issued coats, so that when they wore that particular coat, it all looked the same. If they were begging on a particular street corner, the Roman soldiers could not issue them a move-on notice. Make sense to you? So, this was a familiar coat for him. And sometimes, we can wear things that we're so used to using to explain ourselves to people. I'm like this because I'm such and such survivor. I'm like this. Now, there's nothing wrong with explaining ourselves, but the Bible says for us to walk into wholeness, we need to part ways with the familiarity of what that feels like for us. Mark 10 verse 50, observe the order. It says this, and throwing aside his garment. That's the first step or coat. He rose and came to Jesus, and then Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus had a conviction that the posture of vulnerability means I need to throw off my coat first. I'm gonna be really exposed. What I've been so used to all of these years, it's actually given me the license to earn money from my dysfunction. I can explain, people understand what I'm about when I wear this, but when I throw this off, it's time for the church to say, ah, I wanna part ways the familiarity with the familiarity of what I've always known. I've always been a very short-tempered person, that's how I roll. No, part ways with it. Come on, 
Oh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm always, I'm a bit insensitive. That, that's, 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 that's how I am. That's how my mum was. You know, we're just, we just straight down the line, people. Part ways with that. Be kind. Put on Christ. Come on. There has to be an understanding that in all of us, we're going to part ways because the only person that a blind beggar's coat limits for as long as it is worn is the beggar himself. The only person that any kind of lack of wholeness inhibits is the person who is unwilling to part ways with it. You guys getting something out of this? In John chapter five, Jesus calls by a place called the Pool of Bethesda. It's like a massive man-made pool with like colonnades around it, probably one and a half times this auditorium size and probably a thousand people would crowd around this big pool filled with water. This was, this was you know, like a prophetic picture of the time would come when Jesus would actually die and rise again and everyone would be healed. But an angel would come and stir the water and these sick people and infirm people that crowded around, about a thousand of them would, would kind of clamor to get in the water and be healed. And Jesus comes upon this day a paralytic, and has a conversation with him. It says this in John 5, verse 5. Now a certain man who was there who had been infirm or had an infirmity 38 years, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time. Remember you know that Jesus knows everything? He said to him, do you want to be made sozo? Oh, wow. The sick man answered, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. What a... Strange question, Jesus. There's a thousand people here. Everybody wants to be made well. Uh, what, what's, what's, what, hello? But Jesus asked him, do you want to be made well? What was Jesus saying? He said, I know all about you, sir, 38 years. And to survive 38 years on the streets of Jerusalem, you'd have learned some tricks. You'd have learned some begging styles. You'd have learned how to look a bit sicker than you are. So people have, you'd have learned how that if you have half hang your beggar's coat halfway, a little bit look... Come on now, getting real quiet. Jesus knew 38 years for you to survive and then has an explanation, a well-rehearsed explanation. Wow, you know, yeah, look, every time, you know, yeah, when the angel comes, yeah, other people get healed. I, pff, I miss my chance. I miss my chance again today. 38 years and Jesus comes to him and says, are you willing to be made sozo? What do I mean by that? I mean, young man, are you willing to part ways with 38 years of that being your label? Yes. Yes. Are you willing to part ways with 38 years of that being the explanation for your life? Are you willing, oh, come on, somebody. Yes. Are you willing to part ways with the familiarity of what you've known in order to embrace what you don't yes. know? Vulnerability says, I hate my brokenness more than I love how it is familiar to me. Wow. Yeah. Vulnerability says, I hate how it holds me back more than I love how it explains me. And unless you can say, I hate what my dysfunction does to me more than I love what it does for me, we'll never get whole. You guys are getting real quiet now. Come on. I know it's a bit of a sermon. You're wondering why you came to church today. You came to church to get whole. Come on. Came to church to get whole. The third conviction is this. I desperately want to be whole. I desperately want to be whole. Jesus says, what do you want? me to do for you? Do you want to be made well? Did many, multiple times, Jesus in encountering, remember tripartite beings, you're not just dealing with a physical thing, it's much more than that. Do you want, what do you want? And the question sometimes, and I've been a pastor for almost 20 years, and I think a lot of the times people like the idea of being whole, but they don't really want it. Yeah. They like the idea of what it might be, but they don't really want it. How do we know that? Because if you want something bad enough, you're willing to take the steps that are required in order to respond to the invitation to be whole. Do you want to be whole enough to make the changes you need to make? I'll tell you what it meant for Bartimaeus. It meant that he actually had to throw the coat off and actually stand up in front of everyone. You know how vulnerable you need to be? Here's how much you want, and this is where we lose people in the journey of wholeness. We don't want it enough to live in the in-between after we've thrown our coat off and before Jesus makes us whole. We don't want it enough to live in the in-between of breaking it off with a toxic boyfriend and then feeling the loneliness of some months before Jesus completely whole, makes us dependent on him again. Come on, you're getting real quiet. Hello? We don't, we, we don't want it enough to stop drinking and chuck all the alcohol out and 
feel what it's like to go cold turkey for a few weeks while Jesus makes us whole. We don't want it enough to say to the wife, we, we, we need to see a counselor and we need prayer ministry and we're probably gonna have to talk about some really deep stuff that we haven't talked about enough. And I don't know how this is gonna turn out, but I want to be whole more. Come on. What do you want me to do for you? Do you want me to be, do you wanna be made whole more than you're afraid of being vulnerable? Because let me ask you the question, what are you afraid of? That God might actually find out about you? You think God might go, oh, Ken Fletcher. Oh my gosh, I did not know that about you. (laughs) Hannah Beatham. (gasps) You think that way? What are you so afraid of? And then think about what you're afraid of when it comes to people. That the people you sit next to are going to find out that you struggle with that grief, that offense, that dysfunction, that temper, that addiction. Guess what? They're probably struggling with worse than you. Good preaching, PK, good preaching. <laughs> but what is it that you want? I mean, uh, there, there, there is, there is a, a, a part in all of us that's got the desire to say yes to the invitation enough to throw our coat off. Some of us, we, want, we, we like the idea of wholeness, but we won't even leave our seat to come up to the front for prayer. Yeah. Getting real quiet now, yeah. right? We have mobile phones on our couch we can dial in the number of a counselor, of someone who could minister to us and pray for us. And I don't want to gain age and wrinkles through the years, but watch my potential whittle away because I like the idea of wholeness, but I don't want to be it enough. My prayer for us in this season is that the invitation for wholeness deserves a response of vulnerability. And as I look back on all the years of the different junctures of my life, I'm so glad, I'm so glad for the gift of wholeness. Talked about my young adult years, there have been seasons where I've been so bitter at God for the disability of my son, I've had to deal with a wholeness issue there. There have been seasons in our marriage and different things I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying it's blessed. I'm saying, why stay where you are when God has a sozo life and the life that you want is on the other side of your vulnerability. The marriage that you want is in front of you, right in front of you, the the children that you wanna raise, they're all in front of you, but it requires that you want the wholeness enough to bless your future. Come on, can we give Jesus a resounding amen? It's your inheritance but you will only enjoy it if you're willing to access it with a posture of vulnerability. Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise? Come on, would you stand here?